He was born in Canada, so he's not all bad. A. Eh? <laughs> he entered the diocesan seminary in the midst of his philosophy studies to pursue a possible vocation to the priesthood. And as he discovered, like many of you, the Novus Ordo and their seminaries were anything but Catholic. Leaving Canada, he continued with his graduate work in theology at San Tommaso de Aquino in Rome. And I'm going to try a little bit of Italian. I don't know how to speak Italian, but it looked pretty neat. So I was like, maybe I can try this and sound a little intelligent. Il pese pusa dalla testa. <laughs> I'm a quick study, I guess, uh, in language. Um, that means the fish stinks from the head. And, <laughs> and that seemed to prove true. He left Rome in search of orthodoxy and entered the traditional seminary in France. Um, in the end, a priestly vocation was not his. And... He, he's here with his wife and two of his eight children, I believe. Mr. Knight also uh, has taught logic at the college level, as well as algebra and history at the secondary school level. In the 1990s, he has focused his endeavor to computer science programming and has become a key member of a software development team for an e-learning company with his philosophy, theology, and general education background, along with his corporate e-learning experience. He began in 2005 laying the foundation for truly Catholic online education, namely Corpus Christi University, for those of you that might be interested in that. I would like to welcome and have you and ask you to welcome to the lectern for this last talk of this evening. Mr. Jeffrey Knight. Dear Reverend Fathers, Reverend Mother, dear sisters, Reverend Brother, and fellow laity, uh, great honor to be here this evening. I bought a set of glasses for the occasion because Jim Schindler said that if you're wearing the glasses, they might not throw stuff at you. So I don't know if I'll use these, but if the crowd starts to get irate, I'll put them on. When Father Benedict Hughes asked me to give a talk on the subject, um, or for the conference, he wanted me to come up with some thoughts, and, and principally, he wanted me to address the illogical position of the r and enterprise. Um, many years of my life have been spent in that enterprise. I'm a bit of an expert in its fallacies and in its uh, misguidance. Um, as Father mentioned in the little bio there, I entered the Nova Soto Seminary in Canada, uh, certainly believing myself to be gravely unworthy to enter the hallowed halls of a priestly uh, formation, uh, soon to find out that it was anything but Catholic. And this is probably the first step in, in lifting the veils of culpable ignorance for me um, it was my diocesan seminary. My father was superintendent of the Catholic school board system, and I knew virtually nothing. But I thought perhaps God wanted me to be a priest. So I entered the seminary and uh, soon found out, due to some very obvious issues in the seminary, that they were really doing anything but forming good holy Catholic priests. So desiring the end still, I thought, where do I go to even know what the priesthood is? Basically, I was born in 61. The revolution in our diocese was fast and uh, fastest in the seminary. I think by 1966, they, took, they brought a crane into the sanctuary and uh, picked up the beautiful Italian marble altar, some 40 feet high, took it out of the chapel and dropped it down in the ravine and they destroyed the side altars and the tops of the side altars that were consecrated, of course, uh, altars, 
then became the coffee tables in the lounges in the seminary. Anyway, so a couple externals real quick. Uh, certainly there were uh, men uh, that were less than manly. Um, didn't know of any uh, unnatural vices that were going on, but I was assured that 40% were of unnatural vices or unnatural tendencies. So I, when I entered the seminary, I told God I was going to give him one year to determine whether he wanted me to be a priest. And uh, there were a couple of conservative seminarians still in Novus Ordo, of course, um, and they kind of gave me some works to read. One of them was, one of them was uh, The Duties and Dignities of the Priesthood uh, by St. Alphonsus Liguori. When you start to read that, you realize that they have absolutely no intention of forming this type of man here. Uh, so I, went, I made my way in St. Joseph Cafaso on the priesthood and certainly the you know, catechisms for the first time. Instead of Jesus loves you, it was the Baltimore Catechism or the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And after reading, you know, in, in our rooms, um, you go back to the, to the classroom, and these men of such great experience and wisdom were uh, daily, daily uttering heresies. So I remember going back uh, Christmas holidays, where, you know, back home, my father was superintendent of the Catholic school board, um, I said to him plainly that, Dad, these men are heretics. They're teaching heresy daily from the podium, or fr from, the, from the lectern in the classroom. And his response was a little bit hard. He said, who do you, young punk, I was 23 years old, who do you think you are to be criticizing these men that have hundreds of years of combined seminary experience and knowledge? Um, so I, I kind of just pointed out, I said, Dad, look, this is the teaching of the church. This is what they're teaching. And if I'm going to become a holy priest, if I'm going to give up marriage and children, which in the end I didn't, um, but if I was going to do that, I was going to become the best and the holiest priest I could. And uh, I remember sitting at the dinner table with my dad one time, and it was a matter of um, Adam and Eve and how it was a fable was brought up. And... I guess the subject of original sin was brought up. I brought that up first, and my dad proceeded to tell me that it was a fable, a story. I said, Dad, uh, that's a heresy. And my dad looked at me, well, I guess I'm a heretic. And I said, I guess you are, Dad. And he slammed his fist down on the table, and I had one other brother and three sisters. He says, I no longer have two sons. I have only one, because I declared my dad a heretic. I didn't anathematize them or excommunicate them or anything like that, but <laughs> had we had someone with their wits about them, they, they probably could have right then and there. Uh, from, then, or from there, after the school year was over, I heard that there was a priest, still all Novus Ordo, uh, but I, I knew of a seminarian who knew of a priest in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I was in Windsor, Ontario, which is actually London, Ontario. I think there's a CMRI chapel there in London, Ontario. Um, so it was a fair jaunt. I went for the summer and um, searching for the truth. And, and these priests were good on the natural aspect. And of course, catechetically, they were somewhat sound. But their argument was um, things look bad here in Canada. In 1968, every bishop except one rejected Humana Vitae. There was only one bishop that accepted it. Every other one rejected it. Not that it really held any weight by an anti-pope. But there's a statement there anyways, the fact that they, they rejected it wholesale. Um, he said, go to Rome. Go to Rome because this, in Canada, they're not applying the documents of the Second Vatican Council properly. Go to Rome. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll be faithful to it as opposed to the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. So I went off to Rome. I was finished with my philosophy. I uh, went to the Angelicum, uh, San Tommaso de Quino. And the Angelicum at one time was the highest Catholic university in the world. Uh, Dominican. Um, for the most part, the Italians were solid. They, some of them still said they're Dominican right. So they remain liturgically orthodox. And they were little 85-year-old Dominicans that were, you know, walked about with their summa and pretty much stay fo stayed focused on that um, that was in the Italian and the Spanish sections. Uh, the English section was absolutely heretical. 
And so the first semester was in English, started the second semester, and um, one of the professors in eschatology started his lecture by saying, I may scandalize some of you, some of you may run off to the holy office, uh, but we're going to examine some of the elements that we believe to be de fide, uh, and now due to recent anthropological, phenomenological, sociological findings, we're going to have to call those into question. And we're going to look at them and see, or look at these elements that were at one time, you know, believed to be of the faith and why they are no longer. So that was it. I, I checked out that day out of the English section and I went into the Italian section. And I didn't speak any Italian, but I figured if I'm going to have to go through this stuff, I'd rather hear it in a language that I don't understand. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be so offensive to my ears anyway. But we had the Summa and... Um, yeah, part of the story in going over there that I, I just, because the spiritual director told me to go over there, I went over there with $100 in my pocket, Canadian. I had one change of socks, one change of underwear, and a change of a shirt. My two suitcases were loaded with theology books. And um, I had no place to stay. I, I didn't have a seminary that I was going to. I didn't have a residence. And after the $100 was done, I was on the street. And I remember it was day three now, and I'm turning my eyes, I'm sitting in St. Peter's Square, and I, I turn my eyes to Almighty God, I've got bronchitis at this point. I couldn't fly directly to Rome because it was too expensive, so I had to fly to London, take the train, or take the ferry across to Dieppe, and then take the train into Rome. Uh, so ill, I kind of turned my eyes to God, and I said, Lord, um, I, I said I was going to give you one year. This is going on year two now. I don't know whether you want me to be a priest. Perhaps you do. Um, and perhaps you want me to sleep alongside the Tiber tonight, you know, with the gypsies. And I realize that you've treated some very good friends poorly, you know, for, for good reasons. St. Teresa, for a good example. Uh, and if that's what you want of me, I'm, I'm willing to do that. But if I have my way, I'd like to sleep in a bed tonight. <laughs> and so anyways, I, uh, I had a phone number of a Monsignor. And this Monsignor, was his name was John McCarthy. And he headed up a group called Seda Sapientiae. And Seda Sapientiae was kind of this group of conservative seminarians that either left or were thrown out of their seminaries across the United States. I was the only Canadian. Um, and there was just, there happened to be one opening because someone had just dropped out or wasn't, wasn't able to continue that year. And uh, he had an opening for me. So good man, very fatherly man, um, very priestly man in a lot of ways. He was a valid priest. Worked in the Curia. And the difficulty with, uh, with Monsignor McCarthy, and we've all heard it before, especially in the conservative Novus Ordo realm, that they want to stay within and they want to convert and work within. So the Monsignor knew, of course, that the new Mass is written by Annabali Bunini, a Freemason. Um, he said the, uh, the Novus Ordo in Latin, it was ad orientum with Roman vestments and maniple. We all wore the scapular and a cassock. Um, and once a week, we had an indult mass because it was 1986, the year that I was there, the year of a CC1. And the Monsignor um, had this indult, and there were only two of us that were even interested in the 62 Missal, or the traditional rite as we believed it to be. And we went across town, and, and we once a week had that until the... Um, until the Assisi issue occurred, and the Society of Pius X caused a bit of an uproar in Rome uh, with some cartoons, and they were handing them out at the various universities, showing that uh, our Lord was not accepting John Paul II into the gates of heaven because he was letting one else in. And uh, I guess the cartoon, you may have seen it back then, but it was, it was actually John Paul II not admitting our Lord Jesus Christ into the convention at Assisi, because he didn't know who he was. And it was, uh, the, the secondary cartoon was that uh, our Lord, when it came time for John Paul II to enter heaven, he said, I know you not. So it was the same thing. He was, anyways, a big uproar. But the Monsignor was so concerned about his image and, and working within the official church that he gave up the indult the next day. So we never had the traditional mass again. Uh, I've ended up finishing my academic year there, and then I um, went directly to the Society of Pius X Seminary in France, 
and back to the, the expression that the fish stinks from the head, we were the most conservative group in Rome at the time um, within the official church. There was uh, a group called Mater Ecclesiae, and Mater Ecclesiae was this group of rejects out of uh, Eco in Switzerland that wanted to go back to Rome, and Rome had their arms open, we'll give you accommodation, we'll feed you, uh, we'll give you the structure of a seminary. Um, and so they came, 13 of them. And within, I think it was less than two months, every one of them was thrown out into the street. You know, as they tried to, you know, make them now attend the Novus Ordo and do the new Liturgy of the Hours. And uh, the last one was thrown out because they simply said, uh, what diocese are you studying for? And the young man said, well, I'm not studying for any diocese per se. You said come, and we figured we'd work that out later. And Rome simply said, well, if you're not incarnated into a diocese, you can't do your theological studies. And he was thrown out into the street. So that was my first taste of this big betrayal. And it was a blessing at that time. I'm, being Canadian, we're a little thick. So it, the process was moving slowly. But I did head off to, um, to the Society Seminary in France. And uh, now believing, and it was some fresh air, uh, that was the year that Cardinal Gagno, I don't know how much you're interested or even know about the society history, but this Cardinal Gagno was going to come and review the houses. What they're really trying to do was stop Lefebvre from consecrating bishops. So he came, and this was Monsignor Gagno, who just happened to be Monsignor John McCarthy's superior. So he did the review in Flavigny. And I remember saying to one of the seminarians that if Archbishop Lefebvre doesn't consecrate bishops, it's going to be my sign from Almighty God that I'm not to continue my priestly studies. Because there's no way I'd allow myself to be ordained to go back under Rome. So that was a, a big thing for me. Of course, I mentioned that, and the seminarian ran off to the rector, and the rector said, this guy, this Canadian guy, is doing too much thinking, and he's putting... Um, a, uh, demands and coming to his own conclusions. They don't like it when you think in the society seminary outside of the, the program. And um, they did a review of that house in Flavigny and then the review in Switzerland. And that's what I met Cardinal Gagnon, had a little audience with him. And I told him that for the same reason I went to Rome, so I would have been under him two levels, for the same reason I went to Rome was the same reason I had to leave, and that was in search of orthodoxy. So we were at the most conservative seminary at the highest university under the most conservative cardinal under a very conservative Monsignor John McCarthy. In that group also um, was Father Brian Harrison. I don't know if anyone knows that name, but uh, he, of course he was in, in our Sede Sapiencia group at the Czechoslovak College. So I got to know Father Brian Harrison, and, and I've read some good stuff that uh, I think it was Father, or Bishop Dolan had written on, and maybe Father Chicada, uh, I think Father, Father Benedict as well, that Father Brian Harrison, his, I don't know whether it was for promotion's sake or, or just the exercise of it, but he would try and, as, as the work that I read stated, he tried to pull the, uh, the council documents as far right as it could and pull Catholicism as far left as it could, hoping to have the two meet on this religious liberty issue. So his, his entire focus was religious liberty, Dignitas um, Chuanae. Anyway, so it was uh, from there, uh, doing a little free thinking on, on my own. I wasn't, it wasn't appreciated. And um, they wanted me to take a year out from the seminary for a couple other reasons. I brought uh, an American football to France, and all the Frenchies, I taught them how to play football instead of soccer. And I got in a lot of trouble with the rector over that. I think one day he, he called me into the office, and um, he also had no taste in music. What's well, very atonal. One of the society priests' uncle uh, was a composer of sorts, if you want to say that. And he kind of did a theme and variations on some Gregorian chant. Gregorian chant gets along all by itself. It doesn't need uh, themes and variations, even though there have been some wonderful pieces. But his was a tonal, sometimes um, uh, just a two-note polyphony, but atonal in its nature and just repugnant. 
And I remember uh, stepping out, so Lefebvre, Archbishop Lefebvre had come for one, one of the meetings, and um, I think it was at Christmas, and these Frenchmen were singing this stuff. And I, I stepped out in the hallway and I said, I can't believe they're inflicting this on the Archbishop. And I, I said, uh, the French have a couple words that are really their hot buttons. And, and I, I see the, you know, the guy said, Monsieur l'Abbé Knight, you, you, know, you do not like this, this music. And, and I said, no, I, uh, I would say it's revolutionary. And that word just made the French go crazy. So anyways, that went back to the rector. Because he, he did say that Abbe André, the rector, he said, Abbe André likes this music, Monsieur l'Abbé Knight. And I thought, oh, man, here it goes again. Now it's already the football I'm in trouble for. I'm a free thinker. And now, um, and now it's the, the music. And um, I remember Abbe André he said, Monsieur Abbé Knight, vous avez dit que je bois mon libéralisme à chaque matin avec mon lait. And I said, oh man, I know what he just said, but I need a little time to think about that. So I pulled out my French-English dictionary, and I'm just paging through with his poker face. Kind of like Jim Schindler, you've seen his face like that. It's just plain <laughs> when he's ready to tell a joke or ask a funny question. Anyways, so I'm going through the, and I'm thinking, oh man, what he really did say, you have said that I drink my liberalism every morning with my milk. And he garnered all that from what I said about the music and what I said about the, uh, the silly football and, and some other thing. Anyway, so I put in for a transfer. Um, <laughs> I think it was that same week. No, actually, we were finishing up the chapel, and I hadn't uh, completed my... So one year, everything's in English. The next year, it's in Italian. This year, it's all in French. And I don't really speak French. I do great violence to the language. Um, my grammar is, is absolutely repugnant. Um, and I kind of like that, because when I speak with a Frenchman, it annoys them, my, my French. The accent, the funny thing is my accent is almost Parisian, but my uh, grammar's out of the gutter. So it just <laughs> really troubles them. Um, anyway, so I put in for transfer. I'll get along quickly here. But I put in for transfer, went to, to go to Ridgefield, and Ridgefield was uh, the beginning or one of the seminaries um, after Michigan and before Winona. And um, it was Father Williamson at the time, and he, reading my French dossier, so they allowed me to transfer, but they sent my dossier bound you know, in a lead case. No, it wasn't in lead, but they brought it, and uh, the Father Williamson's reading this thing, and he says, uh, I don't think you have a vocation to the priesthood. I'm thinking, okay. And he says, I, I can see you married and as a teacher. And remember, I'm still not necessarily wanting to be a priest, but if God wants me to be, that's what I want to do. And I looked at him, I said, Father, I would fear the very wrath of God in making such a rash decision on a man's vocation. You're reading this French dossier, and I can, you know, beat every one of those points down. And at the end of the day, he says, um, he was going to let me return. I, I didn't. I, I went. He had me go teach in St. Mary's, Kansas. And he said, come on back next year. But his point to me was, what can we teach you? You already know everything. And of course I didn't, terribly ignorant, just kind of just starting to learn about the church and the faith and uh, studying theology as hard, you know, as well as I could. But the point was, is I was thinking out of the SSPX box, uh, and that was problematic for them. Um, you've probably read some books about the better seminarians in Nova Sordo usually get thrown out, and, and the problematic ones remain. Um, not that I was going to be a, a good seminarian or, or a priest by any stretch of the imagination, but I didn't fit their cookie-cutter program. Um, anyway, so I went off to St. Mary's, Kansas, taught, and uh, that's where I met my wife. And uh, what Bishop William, then, then Bishop Williamson, or still father, I'm sorry, but when I saw him next, he was consecrated. He said, I will be walking behind you with an ax waiting for you to step out of line if you come back. And I thought, you know, I told God one year. I gave him the second in Rome, and now the third in France with a bunch of crazies. Um, I think I'm going to take that as my sign, and we'll, we'll, call that, we'll call that quits right there. So I voluntarily didn't return, and I'm sure I could have marched to their drum. And especially now you see the way that they're going. So my point, I, I guess, in even telling you that silly little story, or my story was 
that this ignorance, we're not allowed to remain ignorant on important things. It would have been a lot easier for me to stay in the Diocese of London, Ontario. My parents would be happier. I'd know a bunch of people. You know, I'd only work an eight-hour day. You know, I'd have big screen TV in the rectory and everything else that you have in the Novus Ordo. Nice car and um, retire early. But um, obviously I couldn't do that because of culpable ignorance, and, and I had to get beyond that. So uh, kind of with that... Um, We'll take a look at the R and R position, and I would say the guilt. Um, and there are a couple of cases in conscience uh, by Father Thomas Slater, great Jesuit uh, from the early 20th century, wrote articles in the Catholic Encyclopedia and manuals in moral theology. Um, we'll look at a scenario, and then I'm going to apply that to fathers of families, to priests in care of souls, to bishops. Um, really to, to everybody, even to yourself, um, how that would apply. So with no further ado, everyone's still awake, I hope. Jim, should I put the glasses on? Okay, culpable ignorance and the great apostasy. Um, I think, yeah, with Pius XII, I, I think so much was covered. In fact, what I did today, I went back to the hotel and I took 218 slides and I reduced it down to 60. Um, and that was going to make a confusing presentation already. So then I shuffled them all up, so it's really messed up. So <laughs> not, not really, but the um, th things were covered so well, um, many of the topics. And I started with this full discourse, and then there would have been so much overlap. And, of course, we would have been here till midnight. and That wasn't going to work either, so... Uh, with this first, Pope Pius XII's warning, I'm sure you've seen these quotes before, um, but he basically looking at the message of Fatima, and he speaks about the danger and even the suicide of altering liturgy, theology, uh, the soul of the church. Um, he, of course, knew well, he had read things such as the Alta Vendita and the message of La Salette. Um, he knew of the goings-on of you know, John the 23rd, um, already Roncalli, uh, Paul the VI, um, Montini, and the wild things that were happening in Rome. So if things were rotten already, like I mentioned in, in our diocese of London, Ontario, that the fish stinks from the head. If it was rotten in the core of our diocese, it was really rotten in Rome. And um, so Pius XII knew well that he was dealing, as did St. Pius X, Pope St. Pius X, knew about the problem of modernism that, that was creeping in. And his father mentioned, uh, the bishop, I, I think it was actually, uh, Bella Dodd and her placement of 12,000 people in the Masons uh, maintaining and, and aiming for that. Um, so this kind of starts with a little um, warning of Pius XII, and you've all read of it before. The um, next... And I think with any, this is part of the problem with any logical discussion, and it's certainly the case when you're dealing with the R&R &R group. When I mean the R&R, &R, principally, of course, the SSPX, recognize and resist, you know, have your Pope and beat them too type of crowd. But the, um, yeah, you have to define the terms. Otherwise, you're not even talking about the same thing. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, definition of terms here, vincible and invincible. Of course, um, we always hear about invincible ignorance. And uh, there are scenarios out there, I imagine. I don't know of any concrete. Um, we could probably come up with hypothetical situations. Um, so here, uh, ignorance is lack of knowledge about something that you're capable of knowing in its general uh, definition. Nescience, of course, would be the second. It's something that you don't necessarily, like, I don't need to know how to fly an airplane, so I wouldn't necessarily be, or I don't need to know all the theorems uh, to be a nuclear physicist. Uh, so those are things that would fall more into the nescience, but we're going to focus uh, principally on ignorance itself. Uh, invincible ignorance 
It's said to be invincible when a person's unable to acquire knowledge of something that is morally speaking possible and obligatory in spite of the employment of moral diligence. So invincible ignorance, if you had took the, um, took the energies and your capabilities and your capacities to try and learn something and you can't, that would be a broad definition of invincible ignorance. The thing about uh, the R&R's stance and even the Catholic faith, especially in the times of the apostasy, you know, our Lord certainly knew and it was foretold that we'd be in this situation. And it's when the faithful can go back, not hard into the theology text, but into the basic catechism. It's not a deep theological issue. My uh, six-year-old daughter uh, recognizes that there's no pope. It's very simple and very clear for her. First off, she hasn't been fed a bunch of fallacies. You know, she hasn't been told, oh, the pope's just a bad father. You imagine an SSPX household. Oh, he's just a bad father. You know, you have to listen to him. He's still your father. He's the bad. No? And, uh, well, no. As a matter of fact, the pope doesn't work that way. Um, and there's a lot of ways, but they'll, I think it was Bishop Dolan referred to the fisherman's um, uh, knot. And um, it's an old uh, fishing adage that if you can't tie a knot well, tie many of them. So if the society, or I'm going to get in trouble with the society for sure, but that might be in the plan. Um, I'm sorry, I'm already on to the next slide. The they would tie together these fallacies one after another after another. So um, it's like this moving target with terms that don't mean the same to them and to us. So it's, uh, the, it's very cult-like in a lot of ways, um, you know, this string of, of uh, knots, of bad knots. In other words, vincible ignorance is termed vincible if it can be dispelled by the use of moral diligence. So if you make an effort and... Uh, in this case, the absence of information which one is required to have. And as Catholics, we're required to know the catechism. We're not all required to read Denzinger in Latin. I certainly can't. Um, or even some of the great fathers of the church. Much of St. Thomas is still only in Latin. Um, and, and very little, you know, there's some that uh, English might be the last language to get the translations, uh, maybe because of its proximity or lack of proximity to the Romance languages. But anyways, uh, the absence of information that we're required to have with ordinary inquiry, reflection, and means available to the prudent person. Now, of course, uh, St. Thomas, when he speaks about education, it's always uh, best uh, um, grasped by, by inspection, by uh, discovery. But in light of that, you're always best led by a prudent teacher. And blessed be God, we have the fathers, we have the, uh, the sisters. And if you don't have that, we at least have the catechism and some basic theology books um, as, as you know, what the church teaches, as the bishop had mentioned. Um, so the ordinary prudent person, God wouldn't say an act is vincible and that we're culpable and then make it so difficult for us to come up with the information. So that's just, this is a bit of a difficulty with, um, with the people in a valley or elsewhere, that um, these things are within their grasp. It's in their Baltimore Catechism. It's in, you know, you've seen the quotes, and I've got some as well, from various councils, from various popes, from uh, canon lawyers, uh, from the great commentators on canon law. It's all readily available. So, and uh, each one of their fallacies are so easily taken down. What you find a lot in, in these r and circles is um, they're only getting their data and they're not researching. And I'm finding that it's a generational dumbing down, so it's worse now 20 years later than it was 20 years ago. And there's less effort made by the youth. In fact, virtually no effort. Um, you'll see the ones that are the more pious, they'll go off to retreats, uh, Ignatian retreats held by the R and R groups, um, but for the most part, those are opportunities for more propaganda. I, I know when uh, Saint Ignatius of Loyola. I don't know if you've been on Ignatian retreats, anyone, but they're wonderful things. Um, and I don't think Saint Ignatius of Loyola 
anywhere in, in his uh, retreat mentioned Archbishop Lefebvre or the SSPX once. But if you go to, the, go to these retreats, you'll hear it a hundred times. It's just, it's kind of the hoorah section. So where the more pious, you would think the more pious, the more they'd break these bonds of invincible ignorance, the more they'd research it, you would think that the more pious would come to the CMRI position. They don't. It's the exact opposite. And the ones that, are, that don't have the piety or as high a degree of piety, what I've found and what I see regularly, they're just living in the world and they're losing their faith, their, their faith at, uh, you know, at a pace that's um, probably faster than, than the Novus Ordo's losing it, what they have left of it. Anyway, so Case and Conscience. This was uh, by Father Thomas Slater. Uh, I think the seminary may use Father Slater. Certainly the priest would be familiar with Father Slater. What Father Slater did outside of the moral theology manuals, uh, he used examples of scenarios so the priest would help, the, you know, would help them in the confessional and in, in their general education. Uh, so in this case, it's a, a young doctor, um, previously a medical student, of course, but he was a little sloppy in his uh, education, partying a lot. Now, this is 1911, so I don't know how, much, how they partied back then, certainly not as they do today. But excessive entertainment, so maybe it was playing polo or, or what, or fishing maybe, I don't know. But as he was practicing, uh, his patients started to suffer from his deficiencies of his education, and the, the prescriptions were doing harm, uh, so, uh, you know, as opposed to good. So he goes off to his confessor. And in this case, he turns to his confessor, uh, and the confessor insists that it's not a matter of scruples. In fact, Albert was guilty. Uh, so his confessor tells him that he must give now time to study. And where, in this case, where the subjects that he lacked, and this is due to his idleness in his school days, uh, the subjects that he lacked or that he was weak in, as opposed to continuing to do damage to his patients, he must bring in other experts. He wouldn't have to give up his practice entirely, but he would bring in other doctors to handle those, and until he gained the requisite knowledge to um, entirely fulfill his medical practice, uh, he had to resolve these issues. Um, Father Slater refers to it as righting the wrong. Uh, so if he does what he can do in this way, he need not give up his practice. The serious danger of doing harm will be removed, and he will soon gain the knowledge without which he would not have begun to practice at all. So this is the case with the doctor. And the next uh, goes on to the degree of culpability of, of ignorance. This speaks kind of in a general way. And the degree of the culpability is relative to the seriousness of the matter and the degree of voluntariness in the ignorance. So you can see where I'm kind of going with this, that it, um, this carries into, would certainly carry into a, a priest's life, carries especially into a, a parent's, well, maybe not especially anymore so, but uh, certainly into the father and mother of a family. I mean, these children, they're not ours. Uh, we don't have the right to mess with their souls. They're given to us as pure vessels, and we have to do everything we possibly can to send them back. And, and part of learning the faith and basic you know, catechesis and education, so it's not just feeding them, bearing them and feeding them. Education plays such a, an important role. So back to Albert a bit. Um, he must be sorry. So this is even before the, the priest can absolve him. He's got to perform these things. Um, so, is, so, much, so far as he can do this in the future, then he may be absolved. I think as long as he made the intention of doing that, he could probably get absolution there too. The, uh, the voluntary ignorance, and then it goes through, and this can be carried into the different uh, realms as well, speaks about the act. So the act itself was the neglect of studies. So that, that's in itself. Um, he neglected to procure the knowledge when, when the act was done. But voluntary in its cause, here you say, in, in so much as the, the formal sin consisted in the neglect of it, and then also in itself. 
sorry if I didn't read all that. A lot of it, uh, I'll just kind of breeze over. But the, um, so voluntary in itself, and this is when there's this uh, inkling. So all of a sudden he's getting this sense that what he's doing here uh, with his patients isn't right. Now, I would say everybody in the R&R has heard the arguments, um, you know, whether it's Cajetan versus St. Robert Bellarmine. Well, St. Robert Bellarmine came after Cajetan, and St. Robert Bellarmine was writing against Cajetan because Cajetan left these holes, and, and St. Robert Bellarmine could see as a doctor of the church and brilliant theologian and a saint, uh, could see that if we left it defined or left the opinion of Cajetan in place, there would be great problems down the road. And, and one of them, of course, is Cajetan would have maintained or did maintain that uh, the Pope, even falling into personal heresy, um, should be deposed or could be deposed. But that left the difficulty of who's going to depose him, whereas St. Robert Bellarmine said, ipso facto, by the act of heresy, he is deposed. Uh, so now you've got uh, the r and r group, you know, they look at this and because of the corner that they paint themselves in or these multiple bad knots that they tie, the Antichrist could be on the throne and their current arguments would not be able to depose him. So Lucifer himself could be on that throne and if they stuck to their same fallacies, they would still have to accept him as Pope. So, you know, they could say, well, it's Lucy, he's just acting as a private theologian, you know, or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah the bad father, the devil, he's a bad father, you know. So you could see that the problems are so problematic, uh, and, of course, they, they're not so clear under a pseudo-conservative or someone who has this sugar coating of conservatism. Now under uh, Deacon Jorge, I think the diaconate was the last valid right that he received, so we call him Deacon George at home. Um, the, I'm just hoping that things go faster and worse so that finally people will be able to break out of this, you know, this mantra of fallacies, this mantra of, oh, you want, it's the via media, you want to stand, you don't want to be too fast to the right because you become a saint vacantist. And you don't want to be too far to the left because then you'll be a liberal. You know, so that's another, you hear them all the time. I don't know if you've heard them as, as often as I have, but um, they, they certainly grind and, and they're, you know, I think they have recordings for the children that they go to sleep by in, in some of these households. So they just memorize because you can't, they're the hardest bunch to break out of, out of their position. Now, I, we kind of have to think of them in, in some respects as the separated brethren, um, so we do have to show charity, and that's the only way we're going to get through to them. Um, you can argue till you're blue in the face, um, and you should argue till you're blue in the face, but with charity. And like I said, hopefully uh, Deacon uh, Jorge in his current synod is, is just doing some really wild things. I just hope it, you know, I hope it goes to, um, to Hades in a handbasket, and it becomes even some of the liberal carnals, so-called carnals, are concerned with what he's up to. Another uh, point by Father Slater, and this is out of his manual of moral theology, is doubt. And we all know that uh, once there is a doubt about something, a positive doubt. Let's say that, uh, there's a glass on the table, and I saw this guy last week put something in people's water glasses, and they all keeled over dead. Okay. Now I see him coming around again, and I saw him put something in my glass. Now maybe it was vitamin C, just to keep the flu down. But I at least, I may not have knowledge, but I have, I have positive doubt that this guy's going to try and poison me. So, and I don't think there's anyone, and certainly not Bishop Fillet, they, they certainly have to doubt. It, it's one or the other. It's pure malice, or they've got another agenda. But um, they have to doubt, and they do doubt whether the man's the Pope. And because they doubt, they cannot treat your, these sacraments of, of ordination and, and consecration, the holy orders themselves, or the Mass itself. I, I'm sure none of us uh, 
genuflect in an oversoul of church if we ever have to enter one. Uh, we shouldn't, of course. Um, there was a while I did, 15 years ago, I did. And, and now I, if I have to be there for a funeral, we don't genuflect and the girls don't wear their veils. I mean, it's, it's a mockery. And we, you, because certainly we have positive doubt on, on that issue. And because we've got positive doubt, there's a certain way that Holy Mother Church wants me to act. And it's to act as though it's not valid. Uh, if I'm wrong, God's going to forgive me, but I'm just following his and his church's guidelines. But uh, I don't think that I'm wrong. Uh, ignorant of the law is not an excuse. And so it's back to this thing, you know, the obligations, the law, the law that parents have, the, the natural law, and certainly the, the divine law, and ecclesiastical law, that we're bound to it. We're bound to learn our faith, and we're bound to, um, to dispel the doubt in our mind if we have it, um, and we're certainly bound to educate our children. So the, there's no back door there. And similar, similarly, there's no excuse in ignorance of, of the faith. And this is again, this one's by, by Joseph Delaney uh, on the subject of ignorance in the Catholic Encyclopedia. And the reason I pulled these out instead of pulling quotes from uh, theologians that maybe wrote in German or Italian and, you know, I'd have to translate them myself and I don't speak German and I do violence, grave violence to Italian so I wouldn't even try it. But the, it's to be accessible by the prudent man, it, the ordinary means that we have to know the faith. So the Catholic Encyclopedia, that's available to everybody. Certainly everybody in the SSPX, everybody in the CMRI has access to these normal tools. It's online. Uh, you do a Google on, on for example, do it, Google on ignorance, Catholic Encyclopedia, you'll pull up uh, Joseph Delaney's article on it. So it's, it's readily available for all. Many people have the encyclopedia in their home or they've bought the uh, CD or a DVD of it, uh, CD, I guess. And um, so it's all readily available. And so a man who would refuse to learn the doctrines of the church from a fear that he would thus find himself compelled to embrace them would be guilty. So that's back to the point of culpable ignorance. Some of them, I've got a good friend. He, his excuse is simply, oh, it's, that's above my pay grade. That's his excuse all the time for you know, not even questioning you know, whether Bergoglio is, is the pope or not. You know, that's, not, that's above my pay grade. That's for the clergy. Um, and of course, in where we're at, uh, he's just going to follow the, the SSPX line on that. Um, so, and of course, it's sinful uh, to, be vi- to be ignorant of these matters of faith that apply to our salvation in our state and life, as, as Joseph Delaney states there. Moral obligation, um, Father Slater again, uh, this time on the term of obligation, and he refers to, you know, we have to do what is good, avoid what is evil, and there's this element of necessity, uh, which constitutes this moral obligation, and that we must take the means to obtain the end. So there's a moral obligation in this case, so if I'm bound to cross the ocean, is his example, and I'm unable to fly, I must go on board a ship. That is the only means at my disposal for obtaining the end which I'm bound to obtain. So if they're bound to obtain that. So if I'm bound to go to heaven, if I'm bound to bring my children to heaven, then I'm bound to educate them. And where there's any possible doubt or if there's even this, this little voice called conscience in my ear that maybe we're not getting all the information that we need or maybe what we're getting is half-baked or outright erroneous, that's, I've got the moral obligation to do what's within my, my means to to find that out. Uh, real quick here, uh, morality in the Acts of Will by St. Thomas and Prima Secunde. Um, basically speaking about the conscience, judgment, and, and what it is. And uh, if we act in accord with our conscience, first off, we're to form it. But then if we act in accord with our conscience, there's no guilt. But in this case, uh, as St. Thomas says in point six, Article 6, actually in in a response, um, if error in the conscience judgment is a man's own fault, so that's back to the point, as a result of culpable ignorance, is what St. Thomas says, willful negligence to learn what he should be learned, the will which follows the erroneous conscience is an evil will. 
and the act of that will is an evil act to the extent of the fault involved in judgment. So certainly on matters of the faith, you know, if, if we refuse, if it's our fault that we don't know about it, and of course I'm preaching to the choir here, you're probably more versed, most of you, than I. But um, back to the R&R, it's why their position is ridiculous and, and it's unsustainable. Um, and it's at, definitely they're guilty. Um, I would say almost this, unfortunately, this next generation is perhaps not as guilty, Uh, still guilty enough to, you know, for perdition. But um, it's this multi, you know, now going on a third generation of of fallacy and and of ignorance. Um, The other point is, uh, and real quick too, and just following, ignorance is no excuse in him uh, by his office, uh, by virtue of one's position or status, when he's bound to know that. So that covers all of us. And it follows Father Slater's example, but follows into, you know, if you're teaching a subject as, as teachers, you're required to know the knowledge. I mean, that, that's your, your state and your duty. Um, but certainly if it's, it's theology that you're teaching. Um, kind of parallel would be the sin of negligence, and this is Delaney this time on, on negligence. And I'm only keep, I bring these up, like I said, they're real simple, and it's right in front of everybody. It's in front of uh, the entire SSPX, and it's in front of Bishop Fillet. It's in front of the, uh, the resistance priests, you know, that are resistance, resisting the move back, back to Rome. And I'll get more into, uh, obviously, and, and that was already talked about uh, extensively, you know, there, there's no way that these men, that these orders are valid, that the Novus, right, Novus Ordo is, is valid. Um, and indeed, this is the great apostasy, and Bergoglio, it's impossible that he's the Pope. But if they take these means, the problem is they're not taking the means, so there's a culpability there. Uh, and sometimes, of course, we feel that uh, it's just time to wipe the, the sand from the sandals, the dust from the sandals, and for many it is. Uh, they're, they're just, they've got this, in, in a bizarre way, you know, it's not moral acts um, in the realm of 6th and ninth, but they've got these cauterized conscience on Catholic doctrine. So for some of them, it's almost impossible to break through. But, you know, if, if we utilize that, um, you know, that teaspoon of honey as opposed to the bucket of vinegar, um, and normally it's them hurling the bucket of vinegar at us. But, um, and finally, it carries on. And if there's a, a work, everyone's been recommending works, I would recommend this particular one. It's a compendium of catechetical instruction by Monsignor Hagen. It's not in press. I, I think that you can buy it on like a print-on-demand. But absolutely wonderful material written in a very clear fashion at the turn of the century. In 1908 is when this particular, I think it was a 1912 version of it as well. But it's back to the duty of parents. And uh, it, it, Father's, or Monsignor's speaking rhetorically. He said, um, but, but you urge, if only I was capable, I should not fail to instruct them. But being ignorant myself, how can I teach others? And Monsignor says, I understand your difficulty thoroughly, but is your excuse valid? So a lot of them will just, a lot of the parents um, will usher the children off to school, and they believe that's the end of the education. Their obligation goes much further than that. Um, And matrimony, it's back to that point, it's like Albert going to become a doctor, that there's no room for ignorance of the faith in marriage. And I fear that many will pay for that eternally, you know, in in failing in their duty as parents. But anyways, a great, I would recommend that work highly. Um, And I was just showing the the parallel there. Of course, St. Gregory the Great, on, on his work, A Pastoral Rule, now, this is principally designed for clergy, but it also it's a parental rule. Uh, no one presumes to teach an art till he has first, with intent, meditation, learned it. So the faith, even before someone's thinking about marriage, you know, even to be, you know, marry a bull, they should be educated. And if not, like Albert, it's time to, to hit the books, you know, as soon as the first little one's coming along. And uh, for any young man or any young lady out there, they, they should... Uh, you know, make that a key point, you know, quiz them on their catechism. Maybe not, but... Um, so he speaks about rashness and, of course, pastoral authority. It's the government of soul, 
of souls is the art of arts or salus animarum suprema lex. So by law, again, um, ignorance is not an option. For any of us, a couple scripture quotes there. So once again, very accessible. It's not like they're having to become great theologians and, and work their way deep in, into the, uh, the tomes of the various fathers, doctors, and councils. Uh, it, it's readily available. Um, Pastors of souls, they must know the faith in order to recognize heresy. And, and you know, the um, Father Casimir was joking about the four persons of the Trinity. Now, that, you know, once the child's corrected, so material but not formal, and then you indicate, you know, the, um, you look at what Bergoglio and look what the Novus Ordo Church, um, you speak about Spain um, under Cardinal Casaroli, and the destruction of their constitution, uh, taking Catholicism from it, and a num- number of the other Catholic nations, um, you can see clearly that another gospel has been preached in, in the Second Vatican Council, if we call it that. The Robert Council was certainly, um, you know, that uh, that other gospel that was being taught. These we've already looked at: uh, Vatican Council One uh, concerning the faith. Um, what we're to believe, and one of the big problems, and I think I deal with it uh, here in a couple slides. The, um, in fact, we'll just go on to the next. One of the problems, and it began, I think, really in the 30s. Um, there was, we've always understood infallibility of the church historically. The ordinary universal magisterium by uh, the R and R group has been thrown under, under the bus. So basically, the infallibility of the church, this indefectibility, I mean, it's very clear this society or the r rs would, would maintain that the church has, has defected in its council, in its sacraments, in its law, in its catechism. And they don't see that the church, you know, they say they're defected in those things, and yet they still maintain that the pope's the pope. Um, so they've thrown it under the bus, and then they've redefined so narrowly what infallibility is. So in their minds, of course, the last infallible statement was that of the assumption. So that, you know, uh, the universal magisterium, the ordinary universal magisterium, they, they give no weight to. Now, they, they may, uh, talking amongst themselves, state that it's there, it just hasn't been practiced. Of course, what that, what that guarantees is not just that it will be you know, expounding on the doctrine, but it'll be safeguarding, certainly, um, from error, the church from error. And that's the function, primary function there. Um, ought as well, on indefectibility. Um, preserved to the end of the age uh, as the institution of salvation. And clearly as such, um, and Ott says here that Ludwig got that uh, she can neither perish from the world nor depart from her teaching, her constitution, and her liturgy. And of course, the, you know, the conciliar church is, has defected from each of those and has departed from each of those. Leo XIII, these are all very uh, clear and, and very, and, and for the most part, they've been addressed already um, or quoted already. Um, the Baltimore Catechism next. So here's something that the society children actually study in their classes um, and as they prepare for First Holy Communion, and it's right here in the Baltimore Catechism. And it's, you know, what do you mean by the indefectibility of the Catholic Church? And we all know what, what it says, and something that is that clear, there's at least got to be, like Albert, this, this inkling that something's wrong, you know, that uh, something stinks here, and I need to at least break out. And, of course, um, it might be will, you know, it might be lack of good will, but a lot of it is certainly the, the mantras that they're, they're being fed. I guess so my, one of my points is we, I don't think we should give up on them, um, but, of course, if, if they're just, um, if they're absolutely close to it, if their hearts are closed, then you, you won't make any headway at all. So a simple catechism, the Catholic Church is indefectible, the conciliar church has defected, the conciliar church is not the Catholic church. 
And that should be as clear to, to us, to them as it is to us. The, um, and I kind of mentioned this here, that uh, they treat the faithful like mushrooms. Uh, the r and too, like mushrooms, and they're kept in the dark, and they're fed a lot of um, fallacies. Um, and then we, we go through, and I've touched on a couple of them already. The, of course, when you grow mushrooms, it's really manure that you're fed. But uh, that's certainly the case um, if you want philosophical manures is, or theological manures, what they're fed and in the dark. Um, and certainly in their seminaries, I think that's, that's one of the biggest problems too. And that's why it just perpetuates and gets worse all the time. You know, as years go on and with new ordinance in the, in the R&R groups, um, is that's all they're fed. So it's not like these men at this point and they don't have at their avail, I, I would think, certainly not in the classroom. And of course, if, as soon as they start to think out of the box, they're gone. But the, um, just all sorts of fallacies, and you've seen them all. You know, the two churches, you know, they would speak about that. The Pope not formally a heretic. Um, meant to have a con- private, you know, it's just his private theologian speaking or writing. Meant to have a contism. Um, I think Father Chicada wrote about that in the Mentivacontism, and he was attacking uh, Bishop Williamson. And the, some radical thinking that because they no longer, because of their modern mind, they do not even know that they're leaving or violating um, or, or, or doing violence to the, to the Catholic faith, which is, um, you know, if a fool like me can get it, can understand it, certainly they can. And, and they've, seen, they've seen all the arguments against, and they know that the fallacies don't hold the water. Or the first sees judged by no one, uh, the perpetuity, the new mass. Um, and, and the worst one is it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether he's the Pope. We're going to do what we're going to do anyway. Um, and as, as someone as certainly as Father Chicada in his, in his cardboard Pope, or um, someone else had mentioned, you know, hang them up in, in the vestibule of the church. But how many of these same people, as they have the, you know, Bergoglio in their vestibule, how many of them have him hanging in their home? I, I wouldn't have the stomach to do it. And I don't think that the faithful of the r and so there's that contradiction, you know, they, they, they say he's the Pope. They have to walk by a picture of him every time they enter the church. And I'll bet virtually none of them have the uh, have him hanging in his house. When I was at the Angelicum, especially in the Italian section, um, you'd want to stay caffeinated so you could make it through the next class. So the classes were 45 minutes, and then you had a 15-minute break. And every 15 minutes, we'd have another cappuccino. And uh, <laughs> by the end of the day, you're wired, and you ate large amounts of pasta, drank some wine for lunch, and then slept for three hours. That was just the Italian way. But the... Um, there was a picture of Paul VI, and now here I was. I, I was singing in one of the Vatican choirs, uh, the Cora Guida. We were um, father, with Father Brian Harrison and team. We were this guiding choir that, uh, so the Italians and, and all, all the visitors would, uh, could follow someone's lead. So we weren't the big fancy polyphonic choir, and we weren't the scola. We were the, Cora, we were the guiding choir. And um, the... Um, So here I was in that, and I was in the midst of all this, and I couldn't stand the face of Paul VI. So every 45 minutes, I drink a cappuccino, but I always have to make sure my back was turned towards Paul VI's picture because I couldn't stand it. And I was mentioning that to a seminarian, and he said, you want to, let's jump on this bus, and I'll take you for a ride. I'll show you my favorite wall in Rome, and um, one of the old Roman walls. And spray painted on it, and it had been there for years. It was Montini est vicario di Marx. So Montini's the vicar of Marx, not the vicar of Christ. So even just just by by this notion, of course, look what he had done. Um, there's so many crimes under under Montini in his uh, reign as anti-pope. Um, but it tells you something right there. If he's really your pope. And there are certain things that you owe them, owe him, and that's certainly we've gone through those already. Um, with uh, let me skip ahead here. With the res- with the respect, the subjection. This is from Boniface the Eighth in his bull Unum Sanctum. 
Furthermore, we declare, we, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Well, they're anything but subject. They, they don't say the luminous mysteries. They don't go to the Novus Ordo. They don't use the code of Canon Law of 83. They, they now accept the, the new rites of ordination and consecration as valid because of a campaign they had in 2005 in the Angelus magazine. Absolutely wicked uh, little um, treaties there. Uh, so they can accept that. And, and the fact of the matter is, okay, if the Novus Ordo was valid, just go to a pious. And if these orders are valid, um, of course, one of their arguments uh, uh, why the Novus Ordo is valid is because the archbishop never said it was invalid. So he never stated that, so we're not going to state that. Um, but if it is, yeah, they're to be subject to him in the liturgy, in the law, in our catechesis, and to have a love and respect for, you know, just waiting for the next Wednesday audience to read what the Vicar of Christ has given us, the food he has given us. But of course, they, they couldn't imagine listening to Vatican Radio to, to hear what the latest Wednesday audience was about. So they, they follow that, um, uh, or they fail to follow the, the duty of subjection. Um, here, of course, Leo the 13th, stating the same thing, and we've already covered much of that. Um, so they know what they're supposed to be. And, and the truth, uh, and Father Chicada mentioned this to me over 20 years ago, and I was just fresh out of the seminary. I was working for Tan Books and Publishers, and Father Chicada said, you know, they're, they're really uh, schismatic. I'm thinking, oh, never thought of that, but uh, I'm, trying, I'm just trying to sell you books, Father, was what I was doing at the time. And, uh, but it's so absolutely true. It's, it's at least schismatic in tendency, um, if not absolute um, schismatic in, in act. Uh, simple once again, and I'll just click through these real quick. They're non-members of the church. Um, and they lose, of course, a, a pope would lose his office. So all they can fall back onto is Cajetan um, and some other, you know, non relevant theologians in their erroneous positions. But, of course, the heretics and the schismatics, and um, they're out of the church. They're not members. Someone in mortal sin is a dead member, but a heretic's not a member at all. And they would admit that, but then they have to go into the material versus the formal heresy. And this is right out of the Catechism of the Council of Trent. So the heretic's no pope. We see that with, with uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Antoninus, St. Francis de Sales. So these are people that they all read regularly uh, in their spiritual reading. St. Francis de Sales, now when a pope is explicitly a heretic, he falls ipso facto from his dignity and out of the church. So you'll never hear that mentioned on an Ignatian retreat with the society. Um, it'll be more, you'll hear the Cajetan line. St. Alphonsus Liguori. If, however, God were to permit a pope to become a notorious and contumacious heretic, he would, by such a fact, cease to be the pope, and the apostolic chair would be vacant. So this isn't digging below the surface at all. This is stuff so readily available. Um, so back to the point is there, it is culpable ignorance. Uh, Canon 188. Of course, we don't, we don't even have to read that. You, you know it by heart, I'm sure. Uh, the St. Agatho Oath. Papal oath, you probably can't see it clearly there. But accordingly, just the last point, accordingly, without exclusion, we subject to severest excommunication anyone, be it ourselves or be it another, who would dare to undertake anything new in contradiction to this constituted evangelic tradition in the purity of the Orthodox faith and the Christian religion, or would seek to change anything by his opposing efforts or would agree with those who undertake a blasphemous venture. So that was the, the papal oath there. Um, and everyone knows that uh, in, in the R&R. &R. So it, it's absolutely, uh, it, it is culpable ignorance. And I, I don't think that they even recognize that. So that's going to be part of my effort is to, with patience and with charity, um, put these things under their nose 
uh, maybe some of these points should be put more evidently in a brochure and we'll put them under the windshield wipers over at IC or something like that. But um, the, the new church, of course, it, it lacks the four marks of the one holy Catholic and apostolic. They would admit that. But one of their knots or two or three or six, they would, after they're done with their poor knots um, and their fallacies, um, well, they could probably think two or three fallacies uh, for each one of those points that would make them sleep more easily at night. So if the claimant doesn't possess the marks, it's not the true church. Papabile. This is uh, from Caesar uh, Badi, Institutione Juris Canonici. Um, now, now, this was by a commentary on canon law. Uh, so this wasn't perhaps right on the surface, but it's clear. Um, barred from even uh, being papabile or, or capable of being put, elected to the, to the papacy would be women, children who have not reached the age of reason, those suffering from habitu- habitual insanity, the unbaptized heretics and schismatics. Um, so, so for the for so many of these arguments, they, they you know, the papabile, of course, you'll see that in cum ex, that uh, before, during, or after, you lose your office, and you could never be raised to the, to the dignity of the episcopacy or the, uh, or the papacy if you were a heretic. And it's, it's really clear. Um, St. Alphonsus Liguori, oh, in fact, I think that's a double slide. That one didn't make it to the cutting floor. Uh, Pius XII speaks of the members, of course, um, speaks about, you know, baptized, profess of true faith. And they would be uh, excluded, uh, the members, of course, you can't, you can't be the, um, head of something of which you're not a member of. Um, St. Robert Bellarmine, uh, just a slightly different point. Very clear on that, uh, and he, he quotes Saint uh, Cyprian, of course. Um, the heretic ceases to be himself, or by himself, to be Pope and head in the same way as he ceases to be a Christian, a member of the body of the church. Again, from the Catholic Encyclopedia, very easy stuff to access. The Pope himself, if notoriously guilty of heresy, would cease to be Pope because he would cease to be a member of the church. And all they have to go back to is Cajetan, who was corrected by St. Robert Bellarmine. And they would say that the, these popes are not pertinacious heretics, and of course they are. Uh, all sorts of heresies um, uh, from religious liberty, universal salvation of JP2, uh, the efficacy of the Catholic sects that we've seen uh, certainly at the CC, but certainly in the documents, uh, Dignitatis Humanae. Um, the blasphemy that we all worship one true God when there are so many. It's all absolutely contrary and against the Agatha Oath um, and contrary to previous doctrines that were defined. Uh, the evolution of dogma, um, of course, is, is another point. The fact that it doesn't really matter, we get that from a famous bishop in the r r group, actually in the resistance to the, uh, to the SSPX, stating it's the question is not of prime importance. So the question of whether the men who have brought about world apostasy and the demise of the Christendom were genuine vicars of Christ or diabolical charlatans is not of prime importance. So if you remove that, and, and I just see the whole, um, this whole resistance to, to Bishop Fillet's movement back to Rome is just as sterile, or as was mentioned earlier by someone, it's just a reset button. We're just going back to the same errors, uh, starting afresh. Um, and the, the comment has been made in the past that perhaps um, the SSPX was originally designed to bring people back into so kind of the false resistance. I don't know whether that was the intention, and perhaps it was, but it's certainly the effect. It's the end. Um, and the reset button of the resistance to, to this uh, movement by Filet, Bishop Filet, back to Rome um, would bring about the same end. The 
Back to the point that if Francis was the true Pope, we'd be bound to assist at Holy Mass in the rite approved by him, offered by a priest approved by the residential bishop appointed by him at our local parish. We'd be bound to recognize that the liturgy according to which nearly his whole church worships is good and conducive to salvation. We'd be bound to recognize his code of laws as good and conducive to holiness. In a word, we'd be bound to practice the new religion and to regard it as a true religion revealed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, of course, they don't do that, but that's what they'd be bound to do if they do accept, if they were to, um, instead of just paying lip service uh, to Francis as being Pope, if, if they truly were to believe, those would be the acts they'd have to take. The sin of schism, as Father Chicotta mentioned so many years ago, consists in refusal of submission to the Roman pontiff or of communion with members of the church. After the deception of baptism, if anyone refuses to be under the supreme pontiff or refuses communion with the members of the church, subject to him, he is a schismatic. Now, we certainly uh, refuse submission, but we don't uh, hold him to be pope. And of course, here's a famous quote by Archbishop Lefebvre, reflections on his suspension. We are suspended a divinis by the conciliar church and for the conciliar church to which we have no wish to belong. That conciliar church is a schismatic church because it breaks with the Catholic church that has always been. It has its new dogmas, its new priesthood, its new institutions, its new worship, all already condemned by the church in many a document official and definitive. The church that affirms such errors is at once schismatic and heretical. This conciliar church is therefore not Catholic. To whatever extent Pope, bishops, priests, or faithful adhere to this new church, they separate themselves from the Catholic church. 1976, that's by the archbishop himself. So if, if they were, as they offer incense at their little shrine in their homes to Archbishop Lefebvre, um, if they would only read that, they would realize... Um, as was stated at this point, this may have been one of his zig moments as opposed to one of his zag moments. But um, uh, could, you, could you imagine Bishop Fillet reading that out or putting that on the DC uh, website right now? And we had a recently ordained priest come over for dinner a couple of weeks ago. A nice young man. Uh, even seemed intelligent. Um, his, the new sermons that, um, that he's giving are just absolutely devoid of critical Catholic thinking. Um, the children, it was funny, um, this is actually by, by another priest, but or the one daughter said, oh, I fell asleep during the sermon, and when I woke up, Father was still talking. So <laughs> I feel like doing that myself. Uh, um, we kind of try to sit closer to the front of church, so... So I don't really give myself that opportunity to to nod off like that. Um, But there it is, right from the mouth of the horse, so to speak, that um, this whole R&R thing doesn't hold any water. What you see by the current government of the SSPX is this anachronistic quoting of the archbishop or purging of the hard uh, statements. But anachronistic because they'll go back to a point when in a zag moment where he's talking about, um, you know, we must have love for the, it's the Romanitas, we must have the love for the papacy, and we don't want to be separated, and we long to be back with, and, and elements like this to, you know, to say this conciliar church is therefore not Catholic. Um, it's new dogmas, it's new priesthood. Well, in 19, uh, or 2005, of course, Archbishop Lefebvre was dead, um, but in 2005, they, they, don't claim it to be a new priesthood, you know, just a slight modification of the words. So if it's valid then, if, it's, if the new rite is valid, it's not a new priesthood. So who's wrong on the issue? We're just about done here. Uh, from a resistance chapel. This was funny because I, I put this one right after Archbishop Lefebvre's uh, comment of 1976. Since the goal of the resistance is to stick to the proper Catholic Teaching, as passed on by Archbishop Lefebvre, we have to reject the non unicum position. So the various priests that were going to come in and say masses in a circuit for those that were resisting Fillet's movement back to 
to Rome. When a priest offers to say Mass for us, we have to be clear on where he stands on this issue, basically whether they believe the Pope's the Pope. Um, and certainly if, they, if this particular priest had only read uh, his mentor, um, well, he, he wouldn't be in the R&R anymore. Sacred Scripture, of course, uh, there, will be a, there shall be a time from uh, Timothy when they will not endure sound doctrine. So it, kind of a prophecy there, but according to their own desires, they will heap themselves teachers, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Um, and, and that's what they're doing. They, they seem to try and find um, and are happy to hear the fallacies. Uh, canonizations, uh, this was an r r response. Uh, that's why these popes don't believe in infallibility, and that's why their canonizations are not infallible, because they don't believe in, in infallibility anymore. So not, not much of an argument, but that's, uh, that was one of the bishop's responses there. And of course we know, and I, th- I think it was uh, the uh, father that had um, made the point, you actually look at the words that were used uh, regarding John Paul II and uh, Paul VI for the honor of the Blessed Trinity, the exaltation of the Catholic faith, faith, and the increase of the Christian life by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul and our own after due diligence and frequent prayer for divine assistance and having sought the counsel of many of our brother bishops, we declare and define Blessed John the Twenty Third, John Paul II to be saints, and we enroll them among the saints, decreeing that they are to be venerated as such by the whole church in the name of the Holy Father, of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The, um, so it certainly sounds like they believe in infallibility. Um, Cisco, same thing, Catholic Family News. And as has always been stated, um, you know, the the R&R Catholics, um, as far as being practical, say to a contest, um, they do not treat them as popes, learn from them, submit their judgment to them, or permit them to govern their lives. Uh, in the end, the, the phrase, they want to have their pope and beat him too. Um, so that, that's, I think that if we could only bring sound reasoning to some of these with humility, um, they may convert. And we can also pray that Francis just keeps going as quickly as he can off the cliff um, because then it becomes more and more obvious and I'm anxious to see what the results are of this ridiculous synod. Um, I think we've just got maybe two more slides here. The mystery versus contradiction. You know, so they state, you know, uh, you know, how will this is their crisis? How will the new pope be elected? We don't know. Um, where's the church's teaching magisterium? We don't know. Uh, when will this terrible situation end? When God wills it. Okay, so it's all mystery to us. We don't have the answers. You know, in fact, the, the position is not one, you know, not providing answers. It's just stating a condition. Um, so they're not satisfying, but at least we don't run into contradiction, and, and the R&R does. And I think that's pretty much covers it. There's just more quotes from popes, uh, from St. Thomas, St. Francis of Sales again. Um, Here's one more by Archbishop Lefebvre. The conciliar church is a systematic church because it breaks uh, with that Catholic church that has always been um, from John Lane. And I wanted to thank, even though uh, certainly the fathers, uh, the bishop, uh, John Daly, John Lane in absentia, a number of uh, Mario Dirksen, um, men that uh, have written wonderful things and, and extensively. Um, I want to thank them um, for allowing me. My, my job is just to learn. I'm not here to teach um, as far as that goes. I'll never write a book on the crisis in the church. Enough people have done that. Um, if I do anything, I'll compile. Um, but really thankful for certainly what the fathers have done and what the CMRI has done. And John Lane, again, he says, um, the only credible objection to the state of a thesis is the notion that Francis does not meet the canonical or theological definition of heretic. For those who have that view, state of a is not a convincing position. For the rest of us, it's almost obvious. For mine, it's absolutely compelling. So Francis is, of course, a heretic, and of course he's not the Pope. But that's the only thing that they can, they can say. So that's the reason for all the knots, and that's the reason for all, all the fallacies. 
Um, so this whole R and R is a false remedy. Um, and given what the church is and what the papacy is, it's impossible for for Francis to be the pope. Uh, he's to be anything but the the anti pope, an anti pope. Um, and even Archbishop Lefebvre used to refer to them as anti Christs and heretics uh, regularly. Um, and similarly, to accept that the Vatican II Church is the true church would demand one to accept the church is not infallible, that it's indefectible, or not infallible, indefectible, and could promote error and contradiction. So the whole r r issue, of course, is impossible, and certainly thanking Our Lady um, and the wisdom that I've been able to garner by her guidance, by the church's guidance, and by the, the good reading, um, I've come to realize that because we were so I was so steeped in it, of course. Uh, so that concludes the talk, and um, 